The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens ripped apart, the Spirit descending like a dove on him. The voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts. The angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. Christ. Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the start of the season of Lent, also the start of our collective journey through the Gospel of Mark. Your assignment this week is to read the first two chapters. So what's in those chapters? Well, the author of Mark begins the Gospel with his conclusion. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This word to us that is being written is good news. And the content of that good news is Jesus Christ, who is God's Son. Now this is one of only four times in the Gospel where that title, Son of God, will be used of Jesus. The third time we heard in our reading last week at the Transfiguration, right? The voice comes from the cloud. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And the final time is the Roman centurion who will use it of Jesus when he sees his death on the cross. The second time it is used is in the baptism of Jesus by John. As he comes up out of the water, Jesus sees the heavens ripped apart, torn apart. This word in Greek is used only one other time in the Gospel, and it is for that moment when the curtain in the temple that hangs between the Holy of Holies, the very seat of God on earth, and separates it from the rest of humanity, when that curtain is torn in two at the death of Jesus. From this rip in the sky, as Jesus comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus in the form of a dove. And it is in this moment of baptism that God is set loose on the world. And immediately the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness. The word there is literally throws Jesus into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is a place of wandering and testing for the Israelites. Their ancestors wandered in the wilderness for 40 years following their escape from Egypt, learning what it meant to be faithful followers of Yahweh, of God. And now, Jesus is there, tested by Satan. Now, this word could have a positive meaning, right? You test a hypothesis. You test a valve or a pump to make sure that it works. It also can have a negative meaning, tempted to some dark end. Now, which is it in the gospel? Well, the author of Mark doesn't give us many clues. However, it certainly previews the main conflict within the gospel. Jesus and the forces of disease, death, and division, all those forces which defy God are in conflict. And yet even in the wilderness, even in being tested, Jesus goes fortified by God's claim on him at his baptism. You are my son, the beloved, the one in whom I am well pleased. And he goes with what a colleague of mine called the support of the heavenlies who wait on him. Now I like that the experience of his baptism is so powerful for Jesus that he is thrown into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Maybe he's trying to figure out what his call is. 
as God's own son. Maybe he's just testing out things that he already knows. But whatever it is, his baptism was not just some washing, but an event. A life-changing moment. And ours is too. It is a death leading to life. A claim by God on us, just as certain as the one on Jesus. In this baptism, we too become child of God. We too go out into a world that will have temptations and tests and wilderness and wild beasts. But we go with the assurance that God is our Abba, our Daddy. That we are surrounded by God's agents, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who feed and care for us. Then the scene changes. John gets arrested. We'll hear more about that later in the gospel. Jesus takes up his mantle, proclaiming the good news. Which is exactly what John was saying. The time has been completed. God's kingdom is right at hand. Change your thinking, repent, turn back, and have faith in the good news. And remember, the good news is Jesus Christ and his story, which is in fact that God's time has come. So it's good news that Jesus calls ordinary people to follow him as his disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John. It's good news. That Jesus' call demands our attention, even before our family. James and John leave their dad in the boat with hired help. This claim God has on us trumps everything else. It's good news that Jesus can speak with first-hand authority about Scripture and how it is lived. A new teaching with authority. Jesus' first public act of mission and ministry is both proclamation and healing, a restoration of the man in the synagogue to wholeness, to community. He follows that up with going and healing Peter's mother-in-law, and then the many who crowd around the door who were sick or possessed with demons, exhausted by the effort, perhaps overwhelmed by the need. Jesus goes to a deserted place, The same word that is used to describe the wilderness that Jesus is thrown out into. He goes to that deserted place and he prays. See, his retreat to recharge is not a step away from God, but a step closer to God to spend time with God. Once Simon and the boys hunt him down, they try and bring him back to Capernaum. I mean, he can be their exclusive miracle worker. A point of pride, something to put on the billboard outside of town, right? Home of Jesus, the miracle worker. But Jesus won't be domesticated, deterred from his path. He belongs to no particular place, but to all people. A lesson he'll really come to understand later in the gospel. He has been sent out to proclaim the message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Believe in the good news to proclaim that message to everyone. And so he did. He goes throughout the region of Galilee teaching and healing. Most probably this was the work of many months going from town to town, synagogue to synagogue. During this time, Jesus encounters a man with leprosy. Now at that time, it was thought that leprosy was contagious. So lepers were cast out of society. They had to announce their disease as people approached them so that they could avoid contact with the one who was unclean. I have to say, it reminds me of the early days of the AIDS epidemic where even caregivers refused to touch patients, sure they would contract this deadly disease. The question is, is what heals the man the removal of the leprosy or just the touch of another human? Someone who says you're not defined by your disease, but by your humanity. Jesus asked the man healed of leprosy to keep it quiet. But the man tells everyone he meets. 
And Jesus begins to attract John the Baptist-sized crowds. So he doesn't even go into the towns anymore. He'll be mobbed. He stays out in the country, a little easier to handle the crowds out in the wide open spaces. But eventually he comes back to his home base in Capernaum. And he also finds he's beginning to get some attention from the authorities. The scribes are watching him as he heals and teaches Four friends bring a paralytic to Jesus so that he might heal them. But the crowd gathered around the house is so big, they can't bring him to Jesus because of the throng. Rather than give up, they take the stairs to the roof of the house and they dig a hole in the roof of the house right over Jesus' head. Lower the man on a pallet in front of him. Now, when Jesus sees the faith those friends have, he tells the paralytic, his sins are forgiven. You see that? The forgiveness comes not from the paralytic's faith, but that of his friends who brought him into the presence of Jesus. How much do we trust the healing power of Jesus? Not necessarily for miraculous cures, but for the power to heal those broken places in our lives. Do we have faith enough to carry our wounded friends into this place, into the presence of Jesus? Do we trust it enough? Do we care enough for them to try? Now the scribes get upset at what Jesus says, and they're correct. No one can forgive sins but God alone. What they don't know is that God in Jesus has. So Jesus gives them what they can accept. He tells the man to take his mat, get on out of there and go home. And he walks away. Now according to the thinking of the day, any disease or disability tended to signal you've sinned in some way. So this was Jesus' way of saying, yeah, that man is forgiven. Once more, he's calling disciples by the sea, followed by a huge crowd of people. And he stops and he calls Levi. Now, Levi is a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were hated for many reasons. They were Jews, but they worked for the Roman occupiers, collecting their taxes. And in return, the tax collectors were allowed to collect a little extra to kind of line their pockets. So they were considered both traitors and thieves. They were outcasts. But Jesus calls one of those to follow him, to be his disciple. Later, he's eating with Levi and other tax collectors and sinners. He's criticized for this because to share table fellowship with someone was not something taken lightly in that day and age, but indicated a relationship between those who were eating. Jesus accepts the criticism by pointing out that, well, only the sick have need of a physician, so why should he waste time with the healthy? His call is to sinners. The irony, of course, is that the Pharisees who criticize our sinners as well, they just don't recognize it. This is the truth we know as Christians who happen to be Lutheran. We are all sinners, even as we are claimed saints in the waters of baptism. With his growing popularity and attention, Jesus begins to get questions about how he does things. Okay, what about the fact that you guys don't fast? Hey, your guys are doing work on the Sabbath. The parables Jesus tells in response point out the obvious. Hey, if you're not flexible, willing to move with this new wine that is Jesus teaching, you'll be destroyed by what you learn. So be made new. He also points out that God's boundaries are for our benefit, not so that the law may be fulfilled. Basically, he just tells his critics, guys, just breathe. We see in these first two chapters of Mark the shape of Jesus' ministry on earth. The good news is that in Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near. 
And we are to change our thinking and our lives, to turn around from the path we have been pursuing and follow Jesus. This is the good news. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, Jesus calls ordinary folks. His call is to those who are part of the in crowd and who are on the fringes. Those who are weird or crazy or have something wrong with them. His ministry is to the sick and the afflicted, to those whose society says lies outside God's care and attention, who are sinners. Jesus touches the untouchable and heals them. Jesus reminds us that the Word of God has authority, and Jesus is that Word to us. And that the written scriptures are meant for our benefit, not just to be followed by rote. He works to cast out those whom demons have afflicted, that work to separate them from others. He sees humanity and others and works to restore that more fully. Listen for these themes as we continue this journey. But also ask yourselves questions based on what you have read. Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent. And it was also the day when 14 students and three staff members were killed by a 19-year-old with a legally purchased semi-automatic rifle at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I was handed prayer that night by Malia, a 10-year-old sister in Christ. A cry for a merciful God to hear her prayer, a prayer for life for those shot and injured, a prayer of healing for the shooter, a prayer for these shootings to stop. Now, we did not get to this place overnight. And while we grope for a panacea, that one thing that will stop the killing, we see over and over in these attacks many places where we have failed. There will be, there should be, ongoing conversation about how we prevent such things, how we make changes to how we act so that these become not only unthinkable but unlikely. But for today, with the echo of the promise that God's kingdom has come near, ringing in our ears, I'll ask you this, is this what God's kingdom looks like? And if not, how do we work so that kingdom might come near? The kingdom of Jesus who comes to heal, to cast out demons, to call us to follow a life of service to others. This is the hard and necessary work that we are called to and we cannot do it alone or unaided. And so we gather around the font and the table. We gather around word and sacrament. We confess our sins and receive the forgiveness of God through that waters of baptism by which we are claimed as God's children. We hear and we meditate on God's word. And then we are fed by the body and blood of Jesus Christ so that we might be strengthened by God to go out bearing the good news of God in Jesus Christ to a world that needs it so desperately. Remember, brothers and sisters, in us, through us, by the power of the Holy Spirit as the body of Christ, in us, through us, the kingdom of God is brought near. Let it be so. Amen.